Tonight's lecture concerns the principles of monarchy and that of monarchy inviolable against the practical considerations of obtaining and wielding power. Henry V, also known as the Count or Comte de Chambord, was the king who did not return, possibly the king that France needed, though did not deserve. What fascinates me about the would-be Henry V of France is that he represents an antithesis to the sort of politician who conflates ends and means in the manner of a Lenin, a man who would not permit the dignity of his majesty to be corrupted by entry into a politics in any way beholden to the spectre of the Jacobins. As Lenin's materialist and conquest-oriented ideology was hell-bent on the acquisition of power by any means, Henry V was content to reign in pretense from his exile in Froesdorf, rather than return if that meant compromising on his principles or disturbing the peace of his realm, in contrast to his namesake, the good King Henry IV, the first Bourbon king, a Calvinist who declared that Paris was well worth the mass. In this vein, Henry V was the 19th century equivalent of a Saint-Louis, though dispossessed of the throne, if not his regality. It is for this reason that many of you will have never heard of the Comte de Chambord, the man living in the abstract, the immaterial, the holy and the mystical, an anti-historical personality, unlike Lenin. We remember the men of action who find the crown in the gutter and raise it up with the sword, rather than those who would walk over the crown of filth. France in the 1870s was presented a choice, a God-granted monarchy in the spirit of Saint Louis, or something else, less divisive, less controversial. The French Third Republic endured not out of any positive commitment, like the rapturous Rousseauian optimism that accompanied the First Republic, but simply the Third Republic was the form of government which, in the words of A. Thiers, divides us least. Henri Comte de Chambord, first known as the Duke of Bordeaux, was born under auspice, um, under, um, <clears throat> under a very set of particular circumstances as the miracle of the House of Bourbon, or the Dieu donné, the God given. I think it's important here to refer back to a bit of French history in the 19th century, given that some of you may not be aware of the circumstances of the French monarchy following the deposition of Louis XVI of the House of Bourbon and its execution in 1793. We, of course, have the revolution. We have the advent of Napoleon, his taking over consular authority. We then have the empire, which lasts from 1804 until 1814. And then, of course, we have a brief Bourbon restoration, which in part was a response to the excesses, the material and the exertions of manpower on the beleaguered nation of France after over a decade of conflict. But also it was a response to the desire of various monarchies in Europe not to repeat another cataclysm that Napoleon represented. However, this proved to be short-lived, despite Louis XVIII, the brother of Louis XVI's grant of a constitution, and Napoleon restored, uh, was restored during a hundred days restoration, only to end at the climactic battle of Waterloo, which ended disastrously, as I'm sure you all well know, and he was definitively replaced by a Bourbon restoration. Louis XVIII would die on his throne in 1824. And I think it's the rather popular aphorism that Louis XVIII came to the throne on the back of a restoration, a restoration that restored nothing except the Bourbon flag, the white, and not the tricolor. It was really under the reign of his brother, Charles X, that there were serious attempts to roll back the tide of the French Revolution, indeed imbuing the French monarchy with an aspect of sacristy, indeed trying to protect the Holy Mass and bring back clericalism and the Catholic Church as the mainstay in political and social life and spiritual life indeed in France. However, underpinning the instability of Charles X's reign wasn't only his attempts to recapture an aspect of the monarchy which had existed before 1789, but there was also a dynastic crisis, and therefore it's essential to understand Henri, 
who would later become the Comte de Chambord within the circumstances of this dynastic crisis for the Bourbon house. Though Charles X had several children, two sons, uh, the Duc de Berry and the older son, Louis Anton, uh, the Duc de Angoulême, both sons by 1820 had not sired any children. Louis, sorry, Charles X did not have any male grandsons, so it was assumed that after the death of both the Duc de Berry and the Duc de Angoulême, that the legitimist house of France would die off and the member of the House of Orléans, Louis Philippe, would ascend to the throne. Matters were made worse by the fact that in 1820, Charles Ferdinand, the Duc de Berry, was assassinated by a Bonapartist, one Louis Pierre Louvel. Now, the reason that Henri is called the Dieu donné, the God given, is because he was born posthumously, nearly seven months after the death of his father, to one Mary Caroline of Naples. All of a sudden, the legitimate House of Bourbon, the descendants of Louis XIV and Louis XV, now had an heir upon which to pin their hopes. And so you can say that Henry was part of this new cult, this symbolism of the revival of the French monarchy, the child who was born in spite of this act of aggression on the royal house, the murder of the Duc de Berry. Nevertheless, Charles X would not be able to hold on to his throne to see this dynastic miracle come into fall and allow Henry V, the would-be Henry V, to reclaim his rightful throne. In 1830, there was, of course, the July Revolution. Now, this isn't the place to go into the details of it, but nevertheless, it's fair to say that the catalyst for the July Revolution was the response to the ordinances of saint Cloud, which were aimed at targeting the press and instituting press censorship, which it should be pointed out was a feature of the monarchical systems of Europe post the Karlbad edicts of 1819. But nevertheless, this was enough to convince the population of Paris to topple Charles X, and he willingly abdicated. The question here, then, was how to maintain the House of Bourbon in power, and all the strategies were predicated around the Duke of Bordeaux, Henry V. Charles X and his unpopular eldest son, uh, the would-be Louis XIX, the Duke of Angoulême, would abdicate in favour of the ten-year-old Henry, who hadn't been stained by any scandal or any political crisis, but also would seemingly be amenable to the Orleanists. The compromise was that Louis Philippe, the son of Philippe Egalité, the Duke of Orléans, who had stabbed his um, cousin, Louis XVI, in the back and supported his execution during the French Revolution, he would act as regent, lieutenant general of the king, and allow Henry V to achieve, after achieving his majority, to become king of France, ostensibly, in a few years' time, thus giving Louis-Philippe around a decade in power. Instead, the National Assembly of France weren't interested in this compromise and declared Louis-Philippe as king, and Henry, at the age of 10, began his long period in exile. It's really at this point with the July Revolution that we have the creation of these two dynastic political camps. We already have Bonapartist, of course, from Bonaparte assuming the imperial dignity between 1804 and 1814, 1815. But now we have the further division into the Orleanist dynasties and the Legitimist dynasties. Where do the Orleans uh, come from? Well, of course, the title Duc d'Orléans, but it's more than that. They were descended from the original Duc d'Orléans, who was the younger brother of Louis XIV. So they are not descended from Louis XIV. They are in fact descended from Louis XIII, but both are descended from Henry IV and both are still members of the House of Bourbon. The legitimists of what they would call the supporters of the would-be Henry V, the Comte de Chambord, uh, were supporters of the senior house of Bourbon, whilst the Orleanists supported Louis-Philippe. Now, why did Louis-Philippe become king, only being a distant cousin of the mainline royal family? Well, in the scheme of French history, French history, of course, the succession operates by a system of Salic law, which was implemented in the early 14th century, where only males of the male line may inherit the throne. 
what a prince du sang or prince of the blood represents in the system is basically a reserve or a contingency family, someone to inherit the throne from a distant branch of the royal dynasty, the descendants of the House of Capet, should the mainline dynasty fail. This happens when the first Capetian branch of the dynasty fails with the death of the sons of uh, Philip IV. Um, in the beginning of the 14th century. Then we have the end of the Valois dynasty during a cataclysm of the French monarchy, the wars of religion in the late 16th century. And now we're entering into a new phase where, where the Bourbons came to power as these Prince du Sang. Now they are facing opposition with a new branch of the Prince du Sang, which represent themselves in the House of Orléans. But it's more than that. As King Henry IV, the first Bourbon, was a Calvinist and thereby represented some sort of ideological opposition to the Valois monarchy, who were, of course, Catholic. The Orleanists were tainted by their association to the French Revolution. Not only was the Duc d'Orléans, who later called himself Philippe Egalité during the French Revolution, a supporter of the French Revolution against Louis XVI, but he was a radical Jacobin and supported the execution of his cousin Louis the 16th. So in this way, you can say that the Orleanists were the radical revolutionary counterpart to the mainline legitimist house of Bourbon. And this is reflected in the style of rulership of Charles X versus the style of rulership of Louis Philippe, who attempted to rule by the consent of the governed during this consensus known as the July monarchy, predicated on the July constitution, which was supposed to give France a system of government closely resembling that of Britain. But in the end, it was ultimately a royal government, which was predicated around a certain select group of ministers, including one man who had been responsible in the press for toppling Charles X, one Adolphe Thiers, who would later serve as foreign minister and prime minister uh, consistently um, throughout the era of the Orleanists, the reign of Louis-Philippe. So this is where we have the division of the French royal family into camps, and we have, you can say, the usurpation, I think it's right to say the usurpation of Henry V by his distant cousin, Louis-Philippe. With the death of Henry's grandfather, Charles X, and his uncle, the Duc d'Angoulême, in 1844, Henry was now the undisputed legitimist pretender to the throne, the descendants of Louis XIV. And in addition, I should mention here, because it's going to become more complicated later on, that, of course, Louis XIV had another branch of the family who would later go on to become the kings of Spain, who were having their own fratricidal conflicts, the Carlists versus Queen Isabella. And to simplify this, this is complicated by the fact that that group of Bourbons who were descended from Louis XIV were barred from inheriting the throne um, by a treaty with Britain called the Peace of Utrecht. But of course, this wasn't a definitive doctrine, especially as the political circumstances which facilitated that treaty with Britain were no longer relevant by the late 19th century. In exile, Henry V styled himself as the Comte de Chambord, no longer the Duke of Bordeaux. After his own French residence, he possessed in exile, the only piece of territory which he was allowed to keep in France after being exiled by the new government. While in exile, Henry married Mary Theresa, the daughter of the Duke of Modena, thereafter referred to as the Comtesse. Fatally for the House of Bourbon, the union was childless. By 1851, Henry had settled in the Schloss Frosdorf in the Austrian Empire, the former place of exile of his aunt, Marie of France. The same year, Henry settled into his new residence. Louis Napoleon effected his coup in France and would assume the title of Emperor of the French, confirming the ascendancy of the Bonapartes in the aftermath of Henry's original usurpation by Louis-Philippe, who himself had been deposed in 1848. If you want to hear about more of Louis Napoleon and Napoleon III and the Second Empire, I have a lecture which precedes this one in the chronology if you want to check that out. The years of the Second Empire were not kind to the House of Bourbon. The Spanish legitimists, the Carlists, had been defeated for a second time in 1849. Napoleon III's Italian campaign allowed the Italian revolutionaries and the House of Savoy to depose Henry's Bourbon relatives in Naples and Sicily, who were not only Bourbons, but he was related to them maternally through his mother, Caroline of Naples. 
Bourbons were also deposed in Parma, and his own in-laws, the House of Austria Este, were driven from their throne of Modena. In 1868, the Bourbon Isabella II of Spain was forced to abdicate, and in 1870, a member of the House of Savoy was placed on the throne, barring both Bourbon lines in Spain the lines of Isabella II and the Carlist lines. The only consolation for this, for the cause of Chambord, was in the so-called liberalization of the Second Empire, which led to a renewal of anti bonapartist opposition in France, both left leftists and from the legitimist monarchists. To learn more about legitimist activism in France, see this rather recent book I have cited in the description, Rudolf's Popular Legitimism and the Monarchy in France, Mass Politics Without Parties. Unfortunately, this lecture would go on for far too long if I had to go into the intricacies of Catholic mass action and legitimist politics from the ground. It would take a dramatic turn of events to topple Napoleon III and usher in the conditions where the would-be Henry V could claim his throne after now 40 years in exile as of 1870. Of course, this dramatic turn of events happens with the Franco-Prussian War the Franco-Prussian War, which results in the capture of Napoleon III at the Battle of Sedan on the 2nd of September of 1870. From the capture of Napoleon to the Treaty of Frankfurt on the 10th of May 1871, the New Republic only existed as a provisional government. The foundation of this New Republican government was opposed by the Orleanists, the Legitimists, and to a less extent, the Bonapartists on the right and the Parisian Communards on the left, who will be suppressed several weeks following the secession of hostilities between France and Germany. Effectively, France was left without a government. The only person claiming authority within the Second Empire after the capture of Napoleon III at the Battle of the Sedan by the Prussians was the Empress Eugenie, who ruled as regent and attempted to contrive that her son, the Prince Imperial, also Napoleon, who would have become Napoleon IV, should inherit the throne. Instead, the members of the National Assembly who already buoyed and opposed to Napoleon III after the liberalizing reforms of the last decade were more than willing to accept a form of government which didn't have a Bonapartist at their head. And of course, amidst all of this, there was this radical proto-communist uprising which takes control of Paris, which is the enemy of most, virtually all, mainstream Republicans monarchists, and indeed the German army, who was waging war on France at this time. The chief of this new provisional government was Adolf Thiers, remember him, the journalist who was responsible in part for the overthrow of Charles X, the Comte de Chambord's grandfather, who was a prominent minister during the July monarchy as prime minister and foreign minister. He was also a bitter opponent of Napoleon III and of the Second Empire. Under the Adolf Thiers government, the Third Republic, what would soon become the Third Republic, had sufficient authority to oppress the Paris Commune and negotiate with the Germans. Indeed, the German Empire had just been declared in the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles, a bitter humiliation for the French. Indeed, Thiers was relatively successful in his approach towards the Germans, ensuring that the German force of occupation vacated French soil well ahead of schedule, while he had to concede the loss of Alsace and Lorraine, something which would cause perpetual animosity between France and Germany, only to be resolved from France's perspective, thanks to the Great War, the First World War. The power behind the government, however, was Patrice de MacMahon, Duke of Magenta, and the most prominent Marshal of France under Napoleon III. After his military disgrace during the Franco-Prussian War and the Battle of Sedan, over which he presided, MacMahon restored his prestige as the symbol of law and order following his victory over the Communards. And in the pursuit of order, he favoured monarchy in principle over republic. He's quoted as saying that every fibre of my being is legitimist. The notion that this French Republic would be any more enduring was damned by historical precedent. Both the First and Second French Republics made way for dictatorship and a return to monarchy. Thiers' position as the Third Republic's first president seemed as tentative as Louis-Eugène Cavignac's position as chief executive of France's Second Republic, acting head of state during an interregnum, the transition from one royal dynasty to the next. 
It was simply a matter of which dynasty would replace the Bonapartes, Orleanist or Bourbon. This damning precedent was confirmed also on the international stage. Queen Isabella II of Spain had been deposed and replaced by a regency that elected Amadeo, a younger son of the King of Italy, as the new King of Spain. A brief Spanish Republic was overturned by the restoration of Alfonso, the, Alfonso XII, son of Isabella II, whose claim was contested by Charles VII, the Carlist or Spanish legitimist claim to the throne. Both Alfonso XII and Charles VII were members of the House of Bourbon, and not only related to the Comte de Chambord, but were his possible successors to the legitimist pretense of the King of France. With the restoration of the monarchy in Spain, albeit with Carlist opposition, France was the only republic in Europe bar Switzerland. And I don't need to go into the fact that Switzerland has always been a republic throughout its history. Something going back to the 15th century. Indeed, the situation in Switzerland is not in any way applicable to the situation in France. One would think that in the context of monarchical Europe, whose sovereigns lay under a revolutionary sword of Damocles, look at the revolutions of 1830 and 1848, the continuation and even success of a French Republic would represent an existential threat to those monarchies. But Otto von Bismarck, the German Chancellor, who bore at least indirect responsibility for the creation of the French Republic, was determined to maintain it, surrendering the principle of European monarchy for the nationalistic principle of Deutschland über alles. The fact that Bismarck opposed a monarchical restoration should figure prominently in one's understanding of the 1870s geopolitical landscape. Bismarck, upon becoming Prussia's minister president in 1862, inherited the vestiges of Metternich's Franco-Austrian centric European system, broke it and remade it in his own image to the service of Prussia at the head of this new German empire or Kaiserreich. As representative of the Reich, Bismarck presented himself as the honest broker of the continent, while ever determined to prevent coalitions at the behest of France to reclaim Alsace and Lorraine. Bismarck needed a France that was divided, weak and isolated, conditions he believed satisfied by a republic and a dissolving or dissipating republic at that. Moreover, Bismarck was not solely concerned with France as much with any international movement that could subvert the German political and social system from within. Socialists, or the Red International, represent one source of subversion of the Kaiserreich, as indeed Catholics, or the Black International, represent another. In 1870, the Pope had lost his temporal possession of the Papal States, the Kingdom of Italy, the knock-on effect of the recall of French troops protecting the Pope during the Franco-Prussian War. In that same year, the First Vatican Council had affirmed the principle of papal infallibility, while those adherents to the spiritual supremacy of the Pope and the preservation of his political influence for the maintenance of the universal Catholic Church were known as ultramonetists over the mountains, which in relation to Italy had a literal meaning in both France and Germany. For Bismarck, the dispossession of the Pope represented at once a triumph and yet ultramonetism supported even tacitly by a restored Bourbon king, Henry V, with all the resources of France at his disposal, would embolden Catholics in the Rhineland and Poland against Bismarck's Kulturkampf, in addition to Catholic Austria that may seek revenge against Prussia for its recent humiliation. Combine this black international with French revanchism, revenge, and Bismarck's paranoia would seem justified. In Bismarck's own words, the re-establishment of Catholic monarchy in France would have greatly increased the temptation for France to seek revenge with the aid of Austria. On this account, I considered it contrary to the interests of Germany and of peace for us to promote the restoration of the monarchy in France. For Bismarck, an anti-Catholic, anti-monarchical France would underscore French isolation. Indeed, in preserving the Third Republic, Bismarck could cynically declare that an alliance of Europe's monarchies, such as the Three Emperors League or Drei Kaiserbund against France, was a response to the threat posed by French republicanism. In this sense, Bismarck could aptly be called the crowned revolutionary of Varzin, Bismarck's hometown. 
He was responsible for shaking as many thrones as Napoleon with a diplomatic genius that eclipsed Napoleon. Uh, John, not real name. Alfonso XII was not a Carlist king. No, Alfonso XII was the descendant of Isabella II, and Charles VII was the Carlist king, if I've made that rather confusing. The only hope for a breach in Germany's consummate self-interest, re-France, came from the Kaiser Wilhelm I, who Bismarck ensured was politically isolated. Conversely, yet likewise as a consequence of Bismarckian policy, the cause of the legitimists in France would not receive aid from foreign governments. And also con compare and contrast this with the fact that the Bourbon Restoration in 1814 and 1815 was considered a necessity by Metternich and the broader sovereigns in Europe, whereas here, unfortunately for King Henry V, the diplomatic situation is in total reverse and at the behest of someone completely hostile to the restoration of the monarchy, in this case Bismarck. While ideologically opposed to the principle of republicanism, the Third Republic's suppression of the communards went a long way to assure the various powers of Europe that the Republic was at least an enemy of Republican radicalism and anarchy, or proto-communism even. Indeed, it should be noted that the etymology of communism comes from the Paris Commune. Spain, while not in a position to exert any major influence abroad, was concerned that the legitimist on the throne of France would embolden and even support the Carlists. Italy, as a secular monarchy responsible for toppling the Bourbons in Naples, Parma, Sicily, ending the Papal States, was an enemy of the legitimists and a friend to Prussia. Indeed, it was an enemy to the ultramonarchists. Russia had been stung by 20 years of French hostility as a result of Napoleon III's foreign policy, and indeed, Napoleon III's attempts to subvert the population of Poland into rebellion against Tsar Alexander II. This hostility helped steer Russia towards Prussia, and by extension, even facilitated France's isolation during the Franco-Prussian War. Any support for the legitimist cause in Russia was found purely in the abstract for the defense of monarchy, as Russians were orthodox, they were not even co-religionists. For now, Russia gravitated towards Germany. Indeed, when self-interest necessitated it, the Tsar was not above making an alliance with Republican France. At which point the monarchist cause by 1894 was all but dead. Of all the European powers, Austria was the most likely ally for the legitimist cause in France. Catholic, imperial, and host to Henry V's court in Frosdorf, as they had hosted Charles X in exile. But Austria of the 1870s was not the Austria of 1815 or even 1866, chased out of Italy and Germany and preserved by Bismarck as a diplomatic necessity. Even before Austria's humbling by Bismarck, Franz Josef and his minister president Belcredi and then Beust had effected a rapprochement with the Bonapartists. In short, Austrian foreign policy was determined by practical and not legitimist considerations before 1870, and a weaker Austria after 1870 could not afford the luxury of foreign intrigue at the expense of its essentially captor and ally, the Kaiserreich Germany. This did not prevent French legitimists from appealing to foreign heads of state. Adolf Thiers, though not a monarchist, understood the expediency of leaning on aristocrats and civil officials of the Second Empire to serve in the Republic's foreign service. However, this came with the possibility of anti-Republican subversion, as was the case with the Vicomte de Gontard Biron, the ambassador to Germany. Biron befriended the Kaiser and the Kaiserin Augusta and made a profound impression on one Count Harry von Arnhem, the German ambassador to France. Monarchy would be the guarantee against a more potent and radical republicanism. That could at any point overcome Thiers and reignite the cinders of the commune. Byron impressed on Russia's Gorchakov point. Um, sorry, so just mentioning my tangential point about the Communist Manifesto. Sorry, what I meant to say is that Karl Marx viewed the communard as in some way representing aspects of communism, so rather than the etymology coming from it. Sorry to confuse that, but I really want to get the point on French legitimism and not this tangential point. Thank you. 
Biron impressed on Russia's Gorchakov, the chancellor and foreign minister, the same point. Arnim was so enamored with the idea of a French restoration that he openly contradicted Bismarck's position on France and appealed to the Kaiser over the head of the chancellor. Bismarck had to compel the Kaiser to drop the scheme, reminding him of the possibility of a Napoleon-style coalition of all of Germany's neighbours against France, and that the Comte de Chambord's clerical Catholicism outweighed any benefit of a fraternity of sovereigns. Arnim, a man that was once considered a possible successor to Bismarck as the Chancellor, was arrested by Bismarck in 1874. If nothing else, this draconian measure taken against a German diplomat by the Chancellor should underline Bismarck's total opposition to the restoration of the Comte de Chambord. The restoration would have to be effected from within France. With Napoleon III disgraced and in exile, the Bonapartist cause was in tatters, the legitimate cause, on the other hand, was stronger in 1870 and 1871 than at any time since the deposition of Charles X in 1830. In 1871, an overwhelmingly royalist assembly overturned a Second Empire-era ban on non-Bonaparte royals residing in France against the wishes of the President Adolphe Thiers. It was now a question of whether the king would be Philippe de Comte de, uh, de, Comte de Paris, Count of Paris, or the Comte de Chambord. Then, on the 5th of July 1871, the would-be Henry V did something extraordinary and dismaying to a large segment of his supporters. He issued a proclamation that read thus. Frenchman, I am ready to do anything to aid my country in rising from its ruins, of course referring to the Franco-Prussian War and the Communards, and in reassuring, reassuming its rank in the world. The only sacrifice which I am not prepared to make is that of my honour. I am not prepared to make uh, I am not prepared to make is that of my honor. I am and wish to be in harmony with the time in which I live. I pay a sincere homage to its greatness of every kind. And whatever may have been the color of the flag under which our soldiers marched, I have admired their heroism and rendered thanks to God for all their bravery. Has added to the treasure of God the glories of France. Between you and me, there must exist no misunderstanding or suppressed thought. No, I will not be silent because ignorant or credulous people have spoken of privileges of absolutism, of intolerance, and I know not what besides of tithes or feudal rights, phantoms which the most audacious bad faith seek to conjure up before your eyes. I will not allow the standard of Henry IV, of Francis I, and of Joan of Arc to be torn from my handle. It is with that flag that our national unity was made. It was with that flag that your forefathers, led by mine, conquered that Alsace and Lorraine, whose fidelity will be our consolation in our misfortune. Frenchman, Henry V cannot abandon the white flag. With this, Henry V was trying to directly capture or recapture the spirit of the original restoration from 1814, 1815 to 1830, expressly linking the result of the early conquests of Louis XIV and consolidation of the Louis XV with the white flag, and that the natural boundaries of France, the current geography of France, was the creation of the Bourbon monarchy under the white flag. It will be apparent that with Henry V, he meant to be restored in the truest sense of the word, with the flag, and in the eyes of the press, possibly to the style of government of Charles V, Charles X, perhaps even Louis XIV. The lack of clarity caused great concern, especially among the moderate monarchists, I use that word in quotes, and Orleanists, who had embraced the flag and the July Constitution of 1830. Chambord's obstinacy and reluctance to claim the crown from the gutter gave Adolf Thiers the advantage to consolidate his own position which he did by extending his role of chief of state to president of the Republic by vote of the National Assembly on the 30th of August. Thiers would joke that Chambord was the George Washington of the Third Republic, the man without whom it would have been impossible. Despite Thiers' elevation to the presidency, he had no constituency, relying on guiding the disparate groups of republicans and monarchists, distancing himself from the legitimists and the more radical republicans led by Leon Gambetta. 
Despite Thiers' success in orchestrating an early German departure in 1873, following the stipulations of occupation in the Treaty of Frankfurt, Thiers had become reliant on a dwindling Republican faction to sustain himself in office. In a series of by-elections, Leon Gambetta's radicals gained the advantage, impressing on the royalists, the Duc de Beaujolais and Pierre Charles Chenelon, that Thiers had to be removed, lest Thiers and his conservative republic was nothing more than a Jacobin Trojan horse. Having gained the tacit support of the military strongman Patrice MacMahon, Brogelis narrowly defeated Thiers in a vote of no confidence. MacMahon then became the near unanimously voted President of the Republic in May of 1873. With Thiers gone and a monarchist as president, the conditions were now in place to offer Chambord the throne. And it is here that I'm going to read some condensed segments, condensed by me from the book by Marvin L. Brown, the Comte de Chambord, the Third Republic's Uncompromising King, and there is a link to that book in the description. And this is referring to what is effectively called the white flag crisis. I've already mentioned the declaration, the manifesto of July of 1871. This you can say is a repeat of that, but an intensification of that also. In spite of the steady shrinking of the royalist majority in the National Assembly, a situation developed during 1873 which placed the throne in the hands of the Comte de Chambord, albeit with conditions he could have held it, at least for a time, and he but been willing to do so. The ambiguities of the early days of the Thiers' presidency of the National Assembly and the presumed need for an entente between the different political groups while matters vital to national life were arranged were now passed. The iron was still hot, though unfortunately for the right, not as hot as it had been in 1871. But even as the political crisis was developing, the intensity of the religious revival was still having as much effect as it did two years before seemingly operating in the direction of a clerical royalist action. Pilgrimages start in 1871 and had grown in number and intensity. By 1873, large groups of royalist pilgrims were now heading not only for Lourdes, Chartres, Saint-Denis, the tomb of Saint-Martin, uh, Paris de Le Moniard, saint anne de Auré, and other shrines, but for Rome itself. Of course, Rome has now been incorporated into the Kingdom of Italy, precipitating the Roman question or the Roman crisis for the Pope. So what is being explained here is that there is a coinciding, a swelling of Catholic support and a veneration of France's own saints, France's own Catholic and royal martyrs, which accompanies the restoration, the prospect of a restoration of the monarchy. Of course, Napoleon III had sustained a significant degree of Catholic influence in French national life, and indeed his foreign policy was predicated on the preservation of the Pope and the protection of Catholics all across the world, from Syria to Mexico to Vietnam. But what we're seeing here is an intensification of that. Now there is not only potentially going to be a restoration of a pro-Catholic government, but of the descendant of San Louis himself. There were great complications in the matters of the loss of the temporal power of the Pope, the Kulturkampf. Perhaps the most spectacular aspect of the religious scene was the movement to symbolize the rededication of France to God by the building of the Church of the Sacre Coeur, the Sacred Heart, on Montmartre. At this time, special influences were at work on Henry V, which would be described as extra royalist. The two figures were Cardinal Pi, Bishop of Poitiers, and Louis Villiot editor of the political organ of French Catholicism, Univers. On one occasion, Cardinal P wrote of Chambord's standing on his principles in these terms. If the monarchy were made in conditions arranged by liberalism, our last religious and national resource would be lost. It is clear that the king would not have lasted six months and would not have been capable of doing anything good during this very short reign. On the contrary, to maintain his principles and to wait the hour of God, this is to reserve for the future that which cannot fail to come. The Comte de Chambord himself never put things quite so compactly. Louis Villiers spoke in similar words in 1873, the very time when many traditional royalists despaired of their king, 
writing in univers. It is dignity, it is honour, it is good sense, which have dictated the expressions on the subjects of the white flag. Earlier in 1873, Chambord clearly indicated he was under the influence of Cardinal P's ideas that the monarchy must be uncompromising in its fundamental position. And as for Villiers, the, fi the fiery ultramonotone, Chambord's letter in Univers on the occasion of his death of his editor 10 years later gave the strongest possible endorsement. He was the most valiant auxiliary of traditional monarchy. I cannot forget the strong adhesion he gave to my words on all occasions when I believe it's my duty to raise my voice before my land. No one was better able to penetrate my thinking. These men helped prepare the pretender for his answers to the fusionists. Now, what a fusionist is, is someone who believes in the combining of the Orleanists and the legitimist factions. After the deposition of the Bonapartists, of course, there are still two royal dynasties as a result of the usurpation of Louis, the, uh, Louis Philippe during the July Revolution of 1830. Now, fusionism does not simply mean the Orleanists and the Legitimists agreeing on a single candidate. It's more than that. It implies some sort of political compromise. Louis Philippe did more than just take over the throne from Charles X, uh, the Bourbon Legitimist. He went further than that and adopted that very brief time during the French Revolution between 18. 91, sorry, 1791 and 1792, where the official title of Louis XVI was not King of France, but King of the French. And he hold, held the moniker of the citizen king who would rule under the principles of the rule of law, not as a result of divine right. It is to that legacy, that brief legacy, which the Orleanists and Louis Philippe, this idea of a constitutional monarchy, and I do mean constitution in the purest sense, as in a monarchy derived by the constitution, not by God, which the Orleanists held to. Thereby, fusionists was more than simply the adoption of a, you can say very derisively, you can say a political candidate to fill a certain political platform, a king to fill a certain role. In this case, any aspect of fusionism from the point of view of the Comte de Chambord and Cardinal P would result in a diminution of the fundamental royalist position, which was meant to be a true restoration of the French monarchy, not simply a republic with a hereditary figurehead. While Henri de Versailles was in Rome in March of 1873, he asked Cardinal P for reasons which would be hard to assess fully to draw up a set of rules which could be the principal basis of the monarchical constitution of France. P proceeded to this task directly, following the basic proposition of Boussaway, of course, Boussaway, the great absolutist apologist and theorist from the 17th century, the Bishop of Meaux. Uh, Columba and I have a episode actually regarding Boussaway and the politics drawn from scripture. Um, I, I think it's behind a paywall now, but it does exist on the channel somewhere. He endorsed representation of the estates, provincial assemblies, and the recognition of local practices. So you can say in this endorsement of the representation of the estates, provincial assemblies, and recognition of local practices, that this is going against the spirit of the French Revolution. It's going against the spirit of the département, something which is embraced by the centralizers. And really, you can say here that this is the beginning, the precursor of Charles Maurras and the Catholic integralist movement, this idea of bringing politics away from Paris and back to the localities, which indeed was the greatest source of strength for the legitimist and the monarchist course, the rural Catholic peasantry. He rejected the idea of either being a constitution, a constitutional monarchy, um, or effectively one impo having a constitution imposed on the king, because this would be an imposition by the will of the people and thereby in complete contravention, contradistinction to this idea of a monarchy derived from God, the difference between a monarch in the vein of Saint Louis and picking up a crown from the gutter. Indeed, if we look in the course of the 19th century, Henry V um, was not alone in this. Of course, um, his contemporary, Frederick Wilhelm IV of Prussia, was offered the throne of Germany 
during the revolutions of 1848. And he famously rejected it saying, I will not cl claim this crown from the gutter. However, there was to be a sincere, a sincere national representation and power was to be tempered with liberties not incompatible with strong and traditional royal power. Non-Catholic groups were to enjoy liberties, but Catholicism was to be the recognized religion of the land. Perhaps in response to the bourgeois fear that he would not govern strongly enough, P. Consul Ennui, in the words of Bousouet, gouverner à Dimon, which basically means rule boldly. But in terms of the Catholic posture, the idea that Catholicism would remain the state church of France, this is a fundamental position because it doesn't actually represent anything that radical. We're talking about a rejuvenation of French Catholicism from the ground in terms of the construction of new churches, the growth of these naturally occurring pilgrimages, but the actual legal basis of the Catholic Church would remain the Gallican Napoleonic Concordat, which had been the case for the 19th century. It's possible to see that, I, I think this is very unlikely, that if Henry V had more support, he may have even chipped away at these precious for the French monarchy aspects of Gallicanism and adopted a political and spiritual posture, indeed referring to the appointments of bishops in France, which is the principle which Gallicanism is predicated on, the idea that it is the monarch of France who enjoys this special privilege over all other monarchs, and that the Church of France enjoys some dependence and indeed the political and spiritual control of the king. Here you can say that if Henry V got his way in the vein of a modern Saint Louis, he would actually want to continue with these ultra monitors veins and give more power to the Pope, who at this point was Pius IX, recently chased from Rome. The statement of principles enunciated by Cardinal P must have made a deep impression on the Comte de Chambord, certainly confirming his outlook, if not carrying it even further. By the 10th of March, 1873, Chambord replied in a letter which Vancey delivered personally. I cannot thank you enough for sending your precious documents. It could be that the very immediate future I will oblige to recall what are the true bases of traditional and Christian monarchy, and these documents then will be of great aid to me. These words are very strong and coming from the Comte de Chambord without qualification and have particular force. Incontestably, the immediate future confirmed his words, and the testimony of such men such as Dupinloup, Fallieu, Dom Paris, D'Orfui Pasquier, Souni, and others attest to the fact that Cardinal P contributed to the persistence with which Chambord clung to the white flag as the symbol of the order for which he stood. The strength of the influence of Cardinal P had on the pretender can perhaps be best implied from the coincidence between Chambord's stand in October and the words written to him by P on the 8th of May. I can fully assure Monsignor Chambord that his acts, as well as his sentiments, are fully appreciated by all those who direct the mother church, mistress of all the others, and that none in its desires transactions which could bring a return, but which infallibly and promptly could compromise a restored reign. To those who say Monseigneur does not seem desirous of returning, I allow myself to say that he is especially desirous of remaining when he has come back, and that he is, on the contrary, in no way disposed not to reign. Pius IX gave evidence of not being altogether satisfied with the failure of the Comte de Chambord to take the throne or his scruples about the symbol he would have to accept. And a case could even be made that Chambord did not indeed, any more than the Comtesse, really desire to face all the realities of ruling France in the 1870s. This evidence, of course, does not diminish the fact of the influence of Cardinal P's words on the pretender. As the crisis approached, the qualities of mind of the Comte de Chambord took on special significance for France. In his way, he was without doubt highly intelligent, but as is the case of many people in exile or sidelined politically, his mind worked in a theoretical way. He was a precursor in social thinking, but certainly not in political thought. King in all his attitudes, he was generally unresponsive to influence around him. Certainly, this was the case with his court and with the Comtesse, whose intelligence was clearly mediocre. The Comte de Chambord, on the other hand, was fully exposed to the French press in all its shades. In a literal sense, he may be said to have been reactionary in this regard. 
implications of the Republican press bringing his contrariness into play. Also, bear in mind, you can say the personal axe to grind in the constant, the, the, the perseverance of Adolf Thiers and his political career throughout the 19th century, the man who played a pivotal role in the deposition of the last legitimist king, Charles X in 1830, and his role now as the recently vacated president, first president of the Third Republic. With political ideas distasteful from his, from his point of view being put forward by presumptuous editors, the emphasis on the primacy of Catholicism and its meaning for traditional monarchy, which characterized the editorials of Louis Velliot in Univers, struck a particularly responsive note for Chambord and made him especially receptive to the point of view of Velliot. But all his reactions were within a very fixed pattern, and clearly the inflexibility of the pretender at this period was especially marked. Some of the attempts made by persons eager to restore the monarchy were extremely well calculated to bring him to relent. For example, Belcastel, a good example of a monarchist to the right, came to Frostorf and tried to woo him on the subject of the tricolor. Monseigneur, when Christ came into the world, the world was corrupted. He extended his arms on the cross and it was saved. If in the French flag, the white were placed on the other colors forming a cross, would Monseigneur accept that? Henry was moved, but he let Balcastel go without giving him an answer. In some circumstance, it is conceivable that he may have considered such a solution. But in exile, and resolved not to compromise on his principles, his demand for the old symbol of the fleur-de-lis and the white banner was unaltered. In most ways, the National Assembly was the centre of French political life and the grand decisions affecting France since the Franco-Prussian War were taking place in, in various sessions in Versailles. But the climax of the monarchical campaign came about after the National Assembly adjourned on the 29th of July, 1873, and before it reassembled in the autumn. The Comte de Chambord and the Comte de Paris, of course, logically should have met in July of 1871, during the time of Chambord's original manifesto, possibly in Paris or Bruges. This meeting had been put off for reasons of mutual pride, both, of course, representing the dynastic claimants of the Orleanist and Legitimist branches, but nothing could justify a further postponement now if the monarchy were to be restored. Between 1871 and 1873, the Orleanists had come to realise clearly that only by the restoration of the Comte de Chambord could the Orleanist family be brought back to the throne. Of course, the Comte de Chambord was approaching 53 in the summer of 1873, and although he seemed to be in relatively good health, he was a very large man, he was very prone to overeating, he would not live forever, and he was childless, had no prospects of having children. And effectively, the presumption was of the Orleans leaders, like Louis-Philippe and Charles X in 1830, that the Comte de Paris would indeed become King of France when the Comte de Chambord died. Of course, they had to overlook the claims of the Spanish Carlists, who were descendants from Philip V and by extension Louis XIV. And they had been, you can say, in contravention, what is more sacred, the Salic law or the Treaty of Utrecht, uh, which holds preeminence the fundamental law concerning the succession or a treaty forced on France under duress as a result of an enemy imposing a peace. You can say that um, this bears somewhat uh, close resemblance to the Hundred Years' War and Henry V taking the throne, which according to a very old French political precedent, uh, could not be alienated. That Salic law was fundamental to the nature of the French reign, hence the precedent being set by the Frankish kings, albeit this was very much reaffirmed during the 14th century. Orleanist claims, however, received a, only a faint challenge if there were to be a reconciliation with the Comte de Chambord, followed by a successful restoration. Of course, having a contender in France would have been far less problematic than allowing the Carlists to come back, albeit from a strictly legitimist point of view, from the position of Salic law. Of course, the Carlists had the better claim, but politically speaking, it was far more acceptable that the Orleanists had expectations that they would become king after the death of the Comte de Chambord. They would inherit the monarchy after the death of Comte de Chambord. In terms of trying to resolve the feud 
between the Orleanists and the legitimist branches, the Comte de Paris proposed the following formula. The Comte de Paris thinks that with the Comte de Chambord, that the proposed visit between the uh, two heads of the families should not give occasion to any erroneous interpretation. He is prepared in approaching the Comte de Chambord to declare him that his intention is not only to salute the head of the House of Bourbon, but clearly to recognize the principle of which the Comte de Chambord is the representative. He wishes that France may seek her safety in a return to this principle and comes to the Comte de Chambord to assure him that he will not encounter any competitor among members of his family. Now, what this effectively means is, at least tacitly, the Count of Paris is resuming the ancient position of a prince of the blood, the Prince Toussaint, as the premier noble of France outside of the immediate royal family. And he is acknowledging the head of the House of Bourbon as his rightful sovereign, which would be a return to the situation we saw really before the French Revolution, because, of course, uh, uh, Philippe Galatea and his treason. According to the papers of one Fête Moon, the Comte de Paris declared to Vancey, my grandfather broke the link. I have come to renew the chain of tradition if the evidence here of him returning to this idea of the premier noble of France, the Prince du Saint, on a more traditionalist line was more in evidence here. But in spite of the warmth and the inquiries of the Comte de Chambord about members of the Orléans family, the discussions did not pass beyond the re-establishing of proper family relationship to more practical matters. Assuming the sincerity of the princes making the pilgrimage to Frostorf, or called Frostorf still being the exiled court of the Comte de Chambord, the press in France now begin to give the, to give the impression of such a fusion between Orleanists and legitimist ideas, not simply a reconciliation of the houses, and the many conservatives working for a united conservative action to bring a restoration satisfactory to all royalist elements were contributing to this impression. Yet after this episode and the death of Chambord, Vancey wrote, Monseigneur did not like this word, as it implied, as I've tried to illustrate, a fusion of political doctrines. Reconciliation, on the other hand, was the proper term for what he had demanded. These two words explained in large part the misunderstanding which developed in France at the end of the summer of 1873. In spite of the fact that no real understanding existed either among the politicians or among the princes, on an air of expectancy in France spread among the population as a whole. Attitudes varying from resignation to buoyant enthusiasm seem to prevail over those of real opposition to the restoration on some basis. The conservatives, but presumed objective observer for the London Rothschilds attested to the tremendous interest on the part of all classes of society to the trip of the Comte de Paris to the royal, effectively the royal court in exile at Frosdorf. One journalist of the Orleanist um, uh, Le Soleil, before then it was the Journal of Paris, um, went to Frostdorf and said effectively um, that Chambord was now the sole representative of hereditary monarchy. It would almost be worth betting that a monarchy will be re-established now in a single night. And this, with a majority of 250 in the National Assembly, he reported on the 8th of August, shopkeepers were solidly for now the restoration of Henry V. The Rothschild informant thought because he represented security to them. Although in late October, this observer noted mass meetings of radicals and the Prince Napoleon holding out support to theirs in opposition to royalism, as late as the 20th of October, he insisted, everybody in Paris and the provinces is prepared for a monarchy. Parisians view the return of a king calmly, almost with indifference, as if it were the most normal thing to happen. Favourable omens were seen by the superstitious, and the Parisians noted the fleur-de-lis in the arms of the city of Paris, and an anagram which was printed in no less sophisticated journal than the Figaro about the significance of the year 1873. This particular anagram, numbering the letters of the alphabet successively and giving face value to Roman numerals, added 1814, the year of the Restoration, the total value of the numbers of Henry V, and got 1873, while adding the value of eight years to 1793, likewise reached 1873. 
During the last summer of 1873, the pen of the Comte de Chambord was busy and the messages he wrote were along his usual lines. One letter, however, could be presented in a liberal light and appearing broadly as it did in late September, considerably lifted the hopes of these fusionists. Radicals showing signs of desperation in 1873 were very zealous in their propaganda, much of which was lured and did violence to the truth. Propaganda collected by the police claimed that all the abuses of the Ancien Régime would appear with the restoration of Henry V and the white flag. This sort of report came to the pretender's attention, and he wrote to the Vicomte de Rode de Béveron on the 19th of September, the feeling that one experiences, my dear Viscount, in reading the details that you give me on revolutionary propaganda in your province is one of sadness. They cannot descend further in taking arms against us, and nothing is less worthy of the French spirit. To be reduced in 1873 to evoking the phantom of feudal rights, of religious intolerance, of persecution against our separated brothers, even more of a war madly undertaken under the impossible conditions of a government of priests of the predominance of the privileged classes. You will admit that no one, uh, that one is not able to answer seriously such ridiculous things. To what illusions does not bad faith have recourse when it acts thus to exploit public credulity? I well know that it is never easy in the face of these manoeuvres to maintain composure but count on the good sense of your intelligent people to do justice to such slander. Apply yourself particularly in appealing to the devotion of honest people on the grounds of social reconciliation. You know that I am not a party and that I do not wish to come to a reign by a party. I have need of the concourse of all and all have need of me. As for the reconciliation loyally accomplished within the House of France, say to those who seek denature this act, that all who took place on that all that took place on the fifth of August was well done in the dear interest of her prosperity, her glory, and her grandeur. Of course, he is referring to the reconciliation between the houses of Orleans and the House of France, rather than simply distinguishing between the House of Orleans between the House of Bourbon. The proper terminology for this would be the House of France. Of course, one takes this letter and one questions. To what extent would this be a real restoration? Not, of course, a restoration to feudalism, but obviously something more modern based on vague principles that have been set out by Cardinal P regarding the representation of local rights and a pivotal position for the Catholic Church. Indeed, a monarchy that is active but is tempered by local concerns and by the estates. So it is at once traditional and yet he is expressly rejecting the letter of a restoration which would entail the direct restoration of the rights, properties, manners that existed before 1789. Reports had been made to the police the very day this letter was being written that there would be a liberal manifesto, and those who were looking for such a piece could not have been disappointed. The Comte de Chambord did not say anything inconsistent with his general position, but neither did he dwell on any point that might do him damage. In other words, it was ambiguous enough to allow anyone to interpret anything they wanted from this letter. On the contrary, he stressed so social reconciliation and the broadness of his appeal and left room for the people to speculate about how far he would go in an understanding with constitutionally minded politicians. This was probably his most politic letter and public opinion was never more favorable to his restoration than after its publication. Although the National Assembly was not in session, great attention was given to the question of how the different groups would vote on a restoration were some sort of proposition to be brought before it. The actual strength of the different parties and National Assembly would not be measured, and the saying of the Duc de Beaujolais, victory always makes prisoners, implying that many members of other groups would always be ready to get on the bandwagon was a wise one. The numerical division between monarchists of one shade or another and republicans was close, with an edge, albeit conditional, for the monarchists. The right or legitimists or the chevaux légers numbered about 80. The moderate right, which was close to the Comte de Chambord, but would not follow him blindly, had about 100 members. 
the centre-right or the Orleanists now seemed reconciled, but expecting certain terms, were in the vicinity of 120. The reunion, uh, the conservative more than monarchists, included 40. To the left of centre, there were conservative Republicans, some of whom might have rallied to the cause, and also imperialists, i.e. Bonapartists, who numbered perhaps 25 in strength. Also notice here how much this is a confirmation of the total collapse of support in Napoleon III, who is still alive at this point, the Prince Imperial, and the general cause of Bonapartism, how it has all been swept away and assuming that the Comte de Chambord would carry through with this, the cause, the unification of all royalist factions, with the, example, with the exception of a few malcontents, it made the restoration of the monarchy seem almost irresistible. The general feeling of the royalists was that their additional and perhaps decisive force was going to have to come not from more conservatives among the centre-left. Not only was the tricolor a sine qua non for the Orleanists, it was especially indispensable if any support from these other groups to the left, i.e. Republicans, moderate Republicans, was to be found for any proposition for the restoration of the monarchy. Therefore, partly because of the situation, heightened importance was attached to the question of the flag. In many ways, the white flag question was artificial. In the 12th century, the French kings had the Oriflamme banner, and in fighting around Gisors in 1188, a red cross had been carried in spite of the early appearance of the fleur-de-lis. Just um, a note on the red cross. Uh, it may be apocryphal, but there's a famous story of when King Philip II of France and Richard the Lionheart went on crusade. The King of France opted, I believe, um, and maybe slightly sort of confusing this to take a white cross with a red background and of course Richard the Lionheart taking the cross of St George the red cross with a white background which later became the national flag of England as opposed to the three lions which represented the royal banner of England so in this case you can say the cross represented the symbol of France and there are many cross motifs in uh um, royalist vexillology, as indeed with the original Oriflamme, uh, before we see the definitive appearance of the fleur de lis, and of course, even before that, we go back to the Carolingian symbol, in which the symbol of the Franks and later the Holy Roman Empire was, of course, the eagle. In the period from Henry the Fourth through to Louis the Fourteenth, the different kings had personal manners, and all through the Cornet Blanche appeared at an early date the panache of Henry IV is said to have been black. The cocards appeared after 1697, and some of these were blue, white, and red, referred to as the colours of the king, even during the old regime. In the strict sense of the word, however, the tricolour flag came on the scene in 1789, there having been no national flag, properly speaking, before this time. Indeed, the origin of the flag was actually suggested by Lafayette as the combination of the royal white with the Parisian colours, which it should be noted, I believe, if I remember correctly, are the colours of Saint-Denis, uh, blue and red. So it is possible if one ignores the French Revolution, <laughs> to recontextualize the tricolour from a thoroughly traditionalist standpoint. Indeed, I find looking at the actual sort of symbolic origins of the tricolour, um, it is rather remarkable that the Republicans could claim it with such zealous, zealous ferocity. On account, uh, one account has it that the 18th century, there were as many as a thousand different flags, 141 of which were white, the rest being of other colours. When Louis XVIII, the brother of Louis XVI, was restored, uh, just to mention this, of course, Louis XVIII wasn't always known as Louis XVIII. He was the uh, Duc de Provence, and he adopted the name Louis in sympathy with his murdered nephew who died in the Temp, uh, Louis XVII, who was, of course, the son of Louis XVI. When Louis XVIII was restored and formed his military household, only the Chevaux Léger wore a white cockard. It is really true, not simply an Orleans position, that the white flag, in the sense of the polemics of 1873, dates from the Restoration. Indeed, when the Restoration happened, the white flag was not the white flag with the golden fleur de lis, it was simply a white flag. Yet it was the flag of France from 1814 through 1813 
the flag which indeed floated over the cradle of the Comte de Chambord, the Dieu donné, the God given, the flag under which the revolution was temporarily checked, and the flag which symbolized to Henry personally all the things in which he believed, the tradition in which he grew up. The person most capable of persuading the Comte de Chambord may have well been Cardinal P, Bishop of Potier, and monarchists approached him in the hope that he could somehow induce the Comte de Chambord to make a concession in favour of the Tricolore. Uh, Monseigneur de Beauvoir, an active Orleanist, attempted to do just this in August. He might just as well have approached Chambord directly. Cardinal P refused the mission of Beauvoir, even when the latter pleaded that not a single regiment in the army would accept the white flag. Indeed, when thinking about the army's role in this, bear in mind that the army and its greatest victories were fought under Napoleon I, and to a lesser extent under Napoleon III. Even recent memory, we're talking about the Crimean War, the Mexican and Syrian interventions, the conquest of uh, Cochin China. All of these even recent campaigns were fought under the banner of the Tricolor. Whereas, you know, what does the restoration have really to look to? A uh, Well, again, some military victories, but nothing to match the Bonaparte's, Napoleon I and even Napoleon III. What do we have? An Algerian expedition, an expedition to, Sp uh, to, to um, Spain in the 1820s, and a brief intervention in the Greek War of Independence. Uh, not quite the same sort of spirit as, uh, as Austerlitz, even sort of Borodino or Wagram, etc., Marengo. To this kind of answer, the approach was, if God wants to serve France, he will inspire her to better dispositions. If not, she will perish, victim of stupid antipathies. At the end of the month, he wrote, the tricolour and its political significance is irredeemably revolutionary. It signifies popular sovereignty, or it simply signifies nothing. It was worse in 1873 even than 1830 for the Bourbons, he felt, for he resented the pressure that was being brought to bear on Chambord to accept the system of transaction and false parliamentary equilibrium. Insistence on the acceptance of the tricolour by the pretender brought the remonstrance. It is too much to ask of a saviour to attach to his neck the stone which has brought the best swimmers to the bottom of the water. And by this, he's referring to all French Republican governments up until this point. He's referring to Napoleon I, he's referring to Louis Philippe, and he's referring to Napoleon III, all of which, all of their careers ended in failure. As long as the Bishop of Poitiers felt this way, there was little hope of concession on the part of Chambord. And just one point before I remember it, only one monarch of France died as a monarch of France in the entirety of the 19th century, and that was Louis XVIII, who of course had embraced the white flag. The Comte de Chambord was ultra-Catholic, but he was not ultra-monotone in the strictest sense of the word. Had the papacy taken a stand similar to that of dupin loup the Bishop of Orléans, the situation would have become still more complex. The Pope was, of course, generally sympathetic with Chambord, his attitude is summed up in the words to a Frenchman in Rome in 1873, say to Henri that what he has said is well said, and what he has done is well done. Pius IX had been exiled from Rome, of course, in 18, um, several times. He'd been exiled twice, one in 1846 and, of course, from 1870. And he, of course, had returned. Thanks to Napoleon III's intervention, he was still Louis Napoleon, um, the president of France, of course, under the escort of the Tricolore. The Pope therefore wished Chambord would accept the Tricolore. In spite of this desire, however, he took no active steps to counsel the pretender in one direction or another on the matter. It is dangerous to put words of any kind into the mouths of other people, yet one wit who lived in the Vatican allowed the monarchist General de Barret to hear a phrase befitting the attitude of the pontiff, and all this for a napkin. No doubt he was more accurately quoted as saying in October, words intended for Chambord's ear, the colour of a flag is not of great importance. It is what it is it was with the tricolour that the French restored me, i.e. the Pope in Rome. You see that with this flag, one is able to do good things. 
but the Comte de Chambord does not want to believe me. Surely Pius IX must have felt exasperation with Henry V for not accepting on the grounds that were basically religious, a symbol to which he himself felt indebted. Indeed, when we're talking about this idea of the personal indebtedness of the papacy to the tricolor, bear in mind that I, I can't remember exactly which pope it was, um, may have been Pius VIII um, or Gregory, again, I forget, I do apologize, um, tacitly accepted the Orléans monarchy and, of course, was very supportive of Louis Napoleon, later Napoleon III of the Second French Empire. So the papacy were willing to be pragmatic in terms of the adopting of a certain flag, so long as one was generally well disposed of the Catholic Church, the extent that Napoleon III was allowing for the restoration of Pope Pius IX and, of course, maintaining him in his position in Rome up until the disaster from the point of view of the papacy with the Franco-Prussian War. With regard to principles on the flag, the Comte de Fallio observed, it is a vicious circle. The prince believes he is not able to yield with dignity until he is recalled to France. However, he will never be recalled until he has yielded, or at least given in some form of guarantee that having returned, he will not raise up a conflict with the entire nation. To try and extricate themselves from the situation, monarchists, both of the National Assembly, the Commission of Permanence, and those quite outside any official capacity, redoubled their efforts to try to find some formula. Again, just bear in mind in terms of this concept of monarchy, if he believed, the Comte de Chambord, that he was returning to France under conditions, that he was not being recalled to implement the monarchy as he saw fit, he would believe that a monarchy, a monarchy with conditions, conditions which weren't pronounced by him, would be a monarchy by the mob, a monarchy determined by the popular will. It is it should be noted that we're not talking about absolute monarchy. We're talking about a monarchy which is not divine right necessarily in the way that we look at Louis XIV and absolutism, but it is monarchy from above. It is the vice regency of Christ as opposed to a democratic monarchy as that espoused by the citizen king Louis Philippe. And that is the fundamental distinction which matters here for Henry V and why he has adopted the white flag as you can say this um, a litmus test of whether the French will accept him as a king. And of course, it is then the prerogative of the king and the tradition of medieval kingship to stand and issue a coronation declaration or make a grant as king. But to have that grant imposed on the king a priori is seen as a fundamental diminution of what it means to be king in the same way that you can say that even though this really pissed off the ultra royalists, Louis XVIII made a grant of a constitution when he was restored to the throne in 1814, rather than having a constitution imposed upon him. The key Orléanist politician in the Commission of Permanence, the Duc de Ordefouillet Pasquier, declared the only monarchy to which we are able to consecrate our efforts is to that of the tricolor monarchy. It is that one which we should make the Comte de Chambord accept, because France will have no others. Combier, a deputy of Ardèche, understood that one restored to the throne, Chambord might make a concession on the flag, but that after 43 years of exile, he was never going to make this concession before restoration. The pretender wanted France to come to him before he would go to France. The Comte de Chambord, who seemed to be waiting for time and events, declared that just as the temporal power was a necessity for the Pope, peace was necessary for France. Moreover, he was not going to be king of a party, and when he was restored, most of his civil servants in all probability would be the same men as had served the Second Empire, men of experience. While his position was the church's need of France and France's need of me, hope remain, remains that a formula could be reached which would enable believers in the tricolor sovereignty to accept the restoration of Henry V. Now, this is an important segment and that it underlines many aspects of the traditional monarchy in that the primary role of a king is to represent peace. Going back to Saint Louis, sovereignty is, and you can say sovereignty and absolutism, the idea that the king holds a monopoly of power is the most basic aspect of absolutism, which has been perverted by um, modern misunderstanding, is 
in terms of the ancientness of monarchy is to be underlined or sublimated to the idea of the king's peace, the peace of the realm, in which the king officiates and manages all of the various powers, the estates, the local authorities, the church, and he is able to produce internal harmony. So in this sense, the priority of peace is an ancient concept, and you can say integral to this aspect of real traditional kingship as opposed to the ends justify the means and taking power by force and imposing an absolutist regime on the French people against their will. Hence, the pretender wants France to come to me rather than him foistering himself on France. And of course, the other aspect, of course, is the king not belonging to a party. The idea that the king is going to become king because the logistics within the National Assembly have a slight majority in favor of the monarchy, and thereby he can become king as a result of some sort of parliamentary mandate, is again anathema to this idea of traditional kingship. The king must be king of all France, or he is not the king of France. France is in him his possession, thereby he is above all political factions, factionalism in general, all parties. And in the strictest sense, you can say that the king is above politics, and above politics in the sense that he is above factionalism. If the king is a party to a faction, if he is brought in power as a result of the faction, and the faction has imposed conditions on the king, then he might as well not be a king at all. The Duc de Mont, who, Nemours, who spent considerable time in Vienna in early October, gave the French ambassador to Vienna, Harcourt, the impression that Chambord would never yield on the matter of the flag. The police agent, who from 1870 to 1883 gave the fullest reports on the doings of the Comte de Chambord, had a conversation with the Marquis de Haute de Pasquier under the uncle of the Duke, although the Marquis indicated inactivity on the part of his nephew. The agent expressed the view that the Comte de Chambord would feel that the monarchist majority in the National Assembly was too small for him to accept the throne. In a later report, the same police officer quoted the Comte de Chambord, I do not want to end like Louis XVI or Charles X, of course his grandfather and his great uncle. I will return to France not only when the heads of the parties opposed are no longer so, if not, I will not. Still another police officer noted the continuing displeasure of the Comte de Chambord with the Duc d'Ormain, perhaps the most fantastic reports surmising stiff conditions that the Comte de Chambord might impose and certainly a sign in the direction of trouble was a rumour that a condition for his return for the king would demand the tearing down of the Bastille column. Of course, the Bastille had been demolished in the early stages of the French Revolution and the Bastille column resurrected on the foundations of the original Bastille to represent the French liberation from oppression. And of course, when you consider how few people were in the Bastille, it seems like a rather tokenistic gesture, if any, if there ever was one. Thus, different indications led one to suspect that no matter what was done, the Comte de Chambord would have his scruples in spite of all possible persuasion. So far as the monarchist politicians in Paris were concerned, the most important words about the flag, along with those of the pretender, were uttered by the president, Marshal MacMahon, who declared to Of Dufy Pasquier, if the white flag were lifted against the tricolor, and it happened that one floated from one window while another one floated from another window, the chassepots would go off, of course the chassepots being a rifle, would go off by themselves and I could not be responsible neither for order in the streets nor discipline in the army. So fundamentally, uh, it comes down to the idea of precipitating a civil war over, you can say in many ways, the hysteria, and you can say quite rightly from the more radical Republicans, a justified hysteria that the king has not made his conditions known enough. He has being politic, he has given certain ambiguities as to the restoration in part, but not restoration of other parts. But for a radical Republican who does not want to see the return of the monarchy or the Ancien Regime, that is not good enough. And so for a France so bitterly divided and of course so bitterly embittered after the loss of the Franco-Prussian War, the idea then of imposing this new government against 
almost universal popular acclaim, in which case he would be a monarch by acclamation as opposed to a monarch by a democratic vote, would possibly signal civil war. And the fact that Patrice MacMahon, the president, a monarchist president, a contradiction in terms, who is there effectively as the regent to usher in the restoration of the monarchy, the fact that he is ultimately as the head of state of France, even in this case, the acting head of state, and as the most prestigious member of the army, is saying that he cannot count on the loyalty of the army under these circumstances, perhaps matters more than any deliberations coming out of the divided National Assembly. As a result of this, there were many attempts at a compromise formulated in the National Assembly and its various committees. And in order to try and find some final solution for this compromise, in late autumn, a deputation led by Chenelon, who had been in part responsible with the Duc de Beaujolais for bringing down Adolf Thiers earlier in that year, led a deputation to the court at Frostdorf on behalf of the National Assembly, and in particular, the Committee of the Nine, which had been responsible for drafting a compromise. Businessman that he was, Chenelon wasted little time in turning to the flag question, eliciting these words from the Comte de Chambord. I never have had and never shall have vulgar ambition for power for its own sake, but I would be happy to devote my energies and my life to France, as she has always possessed my soul and my heart. I have suffered living far from her. She has not fared well separated from me. We are necessary for each other. And of course, this is an ancient monarchical idea, the idea that the king is the father. He is the, he is the, he is the first prince of the realm, but he is also the pater, um, the father of the family. The monarch represents a tribe. It represents a form of natural organism, so to speak, when we're talking about the ideas of Fichte and various aspects of organic nationalism. But this, of course, is older than that. And the idea essentially is that as the real king of France, one cannot remain separated without the other, without both essentially falling into disarray. She, as in France, has a right to all my sacrifices. These are two, however, which she may not ask of me, the principle I represent and my honor. The question of the flag touches the principle I represent and without which I could be incapable of doing good. It also touches my honor. When Chenelon mentioned the adoption of a new flag, the tricolor with the fleur de lis, uh, what this essentially means, the tricolor with the fleur de lis, uh, when the Italian unification happened, a, a compromise was reached in which you have the Italian tricolor of the green, the white, and the red, but you have the Savoyard banner, the cross of Savoy, with the crown emblazoned on the white. Effectively, if this compromise were reached, you would have the royal fleur-de-lis, the blue with the, um, the three fleur-de-lis and the crown, positioned on the white to represent the monarchy, in many ways resembling, at least superficially, the idea of a compromise between these positions, one that would move further away from the strict re-adoption of the tricolor as is. In response to this, Chenelong notes, I noticed on his face an expression of visible displeasure. Passing from the near impossibility to one still more complete, he mentioned the suggestion that there be a flag for the nation and the army, and another for the king. So essentially, the fleur-de-lis, the white flag, would represent a royal banner, whereas the national flag would remain the tricolor. This proposition brought the simple statement from the Comte de Chambord, I will never accept the tricolor. Chenelong perhaps should have closed the conversation as hopeless at that point, but he was not one to take no for an answer. Your Highness will permit me to have heard these words. In any case, I think you do not charge me to report them in Paris. If I reported them, I am certain that the monarchical campaign would be abandoned immediately. Therefore, I forget the words your Highness has just spoken. Speaking thus, Chenelong tried to steer the discussion in such a way as to have yet another chance to lead up to some kind of understanding on the matter. So be it, replied Chambord, but you see what is at the root of my opinions. At this point, Chenelong turned the discussion to the very principles of monarchy. 
the businessman must have exasperated the prince by attempting to tell him about the very ideas upon which he was consciously basing his life. Chambord began to lose his composure and ejaculate broken phrases. The monarchical principle. For 40 years, I have had no other effective mission, and I have not been able to do any other service to my country except to maintain it intact. I have given much thought to it. I do not think I exaggerate its bearing. I trust I shall not let it become lowered in my hands, but it may, I may be a true force to bring France back to the path of her destinies. A diminished king, I should be a powerless king, and I should have the only value of an expedient. The flag is the symbol, the external expression of the principle. It is a manifestation before the people, the only visible one, the only one which has for its any decisive significance, and that is why the flag and the principle cannot be separated. I admire the glory of the French army. I am more proud of its courage, its heroism than anybody. Be assured that after we have met face to face, the army and I shall have an understanding with one another. It will feel what I have at heart. It will always have in me a vigilant guardian of its honor, which is one with my own. I will take from my hands without being offended the flag which I have, ha which I will hand over to it after having presented it to the country. I honour every service which has been rendered to France at any time. I have said it, I am not a party, and I would not reign through a party. I would call to my side every merit, every capability, every devotion. The unity of France, such has always been the programme of my house, the House of France, I would have no other. The guarantee is in my intentions, in my feelings, in my duty, in which I will not fail in the uprightness of my soul, which I hope nobody doubts. It is also the authority which comes to me from my principle, and that is why I am bound not to weaken that principle, either in itself or in that which might I might be represented. I will speak on the moment on my return to France. I will then present to the country a solution concerning the flag compatible with my honour, and I feel sure of obtaining it from the country through its representatives. I am confident that when France and I have found one another again, obstacles will be smoothed down, and concord, which seems so difficult today, will be born of the situation itself. After the failure of Shane Long's deputation, realising that this idea of accepting the king and then allowing him to seemingly dictate the principles of government, even though the king himself may claim the best of intentions, was never going to be accepted in terms of the court of popular opinion, let alone the more Republican-leaning press, or even the moderate Republican press, the Orleanists. Of course, this represents the very antithesis of a fusion of the principles and programs of the House of Orléans and the House of France. Of course, the press of France, after the failure of Chenelong's deputation, were oblivious of the details and believed that the visit, the offering of the crown to Henry V, would represent essentially his acceptance and imminent coronation, and by extension, his acceptance of the tricolor flag. Meanwhile, MacMahon put down various insubordinate elements in the army. Shane Long hinted to conservative deputies of the prospect of a restoration, attempting to present Henry's obstinacy in the best possible light before Henry himself clarified his rejection in a subsequent letter. I have conserved intact during my 43 years, of course in exile, the sacred trust of our traditions and our liberties. My person is nothing, my principle is all. France will see the end of her troubles when she is willing to understand this. I am the necessary pilot, the only one capable of guiding the ship to port, because I have the mission and the authority for this. France cannot perish, because Christ still loves the Franks, and since God has resolved to save a people, he reserves the scepter of justice for the hands firm enough to hold it. Of course, this isn't only reiterating the ancient prerogatives of monarchy, the temporal power and the dominion of Christ represented um, in the orb and the power of Christ and his temporal dominion in the idea of the scepter. But the idea that effectively the authority of the king, it can be recognized or not, people may um, uh, try to subvert it, they may have treason against it, but the idea is that under a true sort of legitimate traditional monarchy, it is not bound by constitutions or popular whim, it simply is one acknowledges it or one doesn't. And in many ways, the popular acknowledgement, the people may be led astray. They may ostracize the sovereign head, but the sovereign head is himself appointed by God. And so in this way, the association, the idea of the vice regency, 
to deny the head of the family, to deny the father, is by extension denying God himself. This letter was carried to Paris by Monte de Reze to be given to Chenelon on the 29th of October by the Marquis de Duboise, with a copy to be published in the Union, a legitimate paper. Chenelon wished there were a way to withhold the publication, but the idea was useless. This letter was published immediately, and within the next two days, an enormous furor was created in the French and foreign press. The royalists were dismayed, thunderstruck, and crushed. One deputy of the right compared the letter to a blow from an oar on a drowning man who thought he was within reach of the rescue boat. The prices on the on the on the ball slumped. The brief reconciliation of the right and the centre right was over, although frustration still united them. The Republican and Bonapartist camps were utterly delighted by the letter. The malicious joy of Adolf Thiers, who would die a few years later, in reading aloud to his friends the passage about the flag of Arc and Ivoy must have been a sight to behold. On the Bonapartist side, the Galois said, he has preferred suicide to dishonour. France has for him the respect commanded by such a noble action. Audre praised him for passing with loftiness and dignity from the intrigue in which people have indiscreetly enmeshed him. The Pay declared, this letter takes from France a king, but leaves her with an honest man. Liberté pronounced, legitimate royalty is dead, without doubt, forever. But in dying it leaves for Frenchmen a great lesson in patriotism and honour and the Republic of France, Gambetta's organ, of course, Léon Gambetta, being the radical revolutionary, had the highest praise for the king's fidelity. The opinion of National and Thauapeau spoke of the greatness of his soul. In general, the press opposed to the monarchy could not have been more lavish in their praise of the Bourbon king. Louis Velio in the Univers said, for us and for others, God be praised, this manifesto shows what a king of France and a Christian king really is. It shows us a man merciful and patient, but above all sincere, who rejects a throne on which God should no longer be seated, and from which the people would no longer be governed according to its rights and needs. The Comte de Chambord, in spite of all his mysticism and willingness against hope against hope, must have realized all the dangers involved in the prospect of a restoration. Words attributed to him by the confidential observer for the London Rothschilds, not unlogically, had him saying, if I had given way to the concessions demanded of me by the National Assembly, I would probably have gained my throne for six months. But after that, I would have been packed off once more into exile, and my second state would be worse off than the first. If I am to be a legitimate king of the revolution, then I am no use at all. And without my principle, I am only a fat man with a limp. The highly questionable authenticity of these exact words does not alter a fundamental and basic truth. Who can doubt that the Comte de Chambord had feelings not far removed from them? Henry V, with his principle and without his flag, simply was not Henry V. No matter how close he came to the restoration, his ideals remained with him, and he found his ideals incompatible with politics in 19th century France. Frosdorf, now seemed more and ever like his home and would be his perpetual place of exile. Despite the temporary reconciliation of the houses of France and the new adoption of the Prince du Saint, the House of Orléans, Henry V's refusal to compromise on principle, other than appealing to the descendants of Louis XIV in Spain, uh, Philippe, the Count of Paris or Philip VII now seemed the most plausible candidate for a monarchy in the constitutional mold or a citizen king. But until the childless Chambord passed away, the monarchist factions in France would remain divided by the obstinacy of Henry V for his refusal to acknowledge anything other than kingship in the truest sense. The Catholic and the monarchist right in France instead looked for temporary relief in their monarchist president, Patrice MacMahon, who, in the aftermath of the white flag crisis, was given a seven-year mandate as head of state. Bismarck continued his unrelenting policy against the Catholic right in France, believing that MacMahon and his moral order would compromise Bismarck's desire for a dissolving, dissipating republic. 
1873, Bismarck concluded his first Three Emperors League, Drei Kaiserbund, that would later be compounded by formal alliances with Austria and Italy and the reinsurance treaty with Russia, which both isolated the French Republic and the cause of the French monarchy. Paranoia in Germany reached a point where a preemptive war against France was touted as a possible solution to any possibility of French resurgence. In a crisis eerily similar to the cohibition of recent governments of the Fifth Republic, by this, the president. The, the president of the Fifth Republic is an example set by de Gaulle when he formulated the constitution. The president rules for seven years, like the original mandate of Patrice MacMahon. But given that French uh, parliamentary elections happen far more frequently than that, the chances are, say, for example, if you look at François de Mitterrand, who was president of France in the 1980s, that you will have governments by Chirac, who of course later became the uh, UMP or the Gaullist president of France uh, during the late 90s and the early 2000s. So what we're seeing here is the Third Republic's example of that, where you have a president with a mandate for seven years, like the Gaullist Fifth, uh, Fifth Presidential Republic, and you have to rely on cohabit uh, cohabitation with these um, hostile governments where the prime minister comes from a different party. And this is true from the fact that the National Assembly throughout the 1870s became increasingly Republican, following on from the tradition of the by-elections which kicked off the royalist coup against Adolf Diaz in the spring of 1873. It had reached such an intensity that by 1876, Patrice de MacMahon was forced to appoint a government led by the Republican and former ally of Adolf Thiers, Jules Simon. The one issue on which the moral order of MacMahon would not compromise was the support of Pope Pius IX and the temporal possession of the papacy, known as the Roman question. When the president and the prime minister contradicted each other over this policy in 1877, Jules Simon saying explicitly that the government will not support any ultra monitors position and not only produced a constitutional crisis over who was more powerful, the prime minister or the president, but it was a galvanizing moment in the history of France, where afterwards to be on the left was to be a secularist and to be on the right was to be a Catholic, as the dynastic pretensions of the various monarchist factions gradually faded into nothingness. The president appointed a new government under de Brogelet, and hoped to win a mandate in the elections of that same year, 1877, to the National Assembly, which instead produced a definitive Republican majority, or decisive Republican majority, I should say. In 1879, a Republican majority was replicated in the French Senate, the upper house as well. Anxious to prevent a coup, the Republican government began interfering in various military appointments, anticipating that MacMahon may use his prestige among the army to do essentially what Louis Napoleon had done in 1851, a self-coup. Instead, with the army under attack, Patrice MacMahon resigned rather than risk a civil war. MacMahon had acquiesced to the moderate Republicans and only intervened when calls against the Catholic Church grew bolder and finally resigned when the army, his own constituency itself, came under attack. He was succeeded by the first Republican President Jules Grévy, with Léon Gambetta as President of the Chamber of Deputies and later Prime Minister. Symbols of the First Republic, notably the anthem of Les Marseilles, Marseilles were restored. Just a little note on uh, uh, Les Marseilles. It was the original anthem of the French First Republic. I, I forget the year it was adopted. I think it was um, 1793 during the original war with Austria, which kicked off the revolutionary and then the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, when Napoleon took power, uh, he changed the national anthem from La Marseillaise to Les Chants du Départ. And when the restoration happened in 1814, the, the, Louis XVIII, who wanted to disassociate himself from the absolutism of Louis XIV, instead elevated uh, Le Bon Roi, uh, the good king, uh, Henry IV, as the model of reconciliation, in the same way that um, 
Henry the Fourth had been brought into France, and over the next um, fifteen years, affected the reconciliation between the Catholic League, the moderate or the politique faction in France, and the Calvinists with the uh, Edict of Tolerance, the Edict of Nantes. So the reification of Henry the Fourth was essential to the restoration. Indeed, that is why the uh, uh, Dieu Donné was called Henry in that same spirit. But it should be noted that, therefore, the anthem of the Restoration was um, uh, God save King Henry, which would have been very appropriate to Henry V actually become the King of France. Um, when we have the July monarchy of Louis-Philippe, uh, I believe it was Le, uh, the Poésien became the anthem. And when uh, uh, Napoleon the third took over. Uh, if I recall, it was either Le Chant de Depart, which was then replaced by uh, uh, the Syrian expedition. I can't quite remember off the top of my head. But the adoption of Le Marseillaise, which it should be noted, was only recently adopted as the anthem of the Communards, definitely signified a radical shift in the Republic's posture away from any attempt at a monarchical reconciliation. By the time of Shambles' death in 1883, following from Napoleon, the Prince Imperial's death at the hand of the Zulus in 1879, monarchism in France, of whatever dynasty, was no longer practicable. Even before the death of Chambord, a proposal was carrying through the National Assembly to banish the princes of France, but it was the wedding of the Count of Paris's daughter in 1886 at a lavish ceremony with thousands of guests in Paris that spurred the law of exile, banishing Orleanists and Bonapartists. In the end, the law of exile amounted to nothing more than an act of petty vindictiveness that exposed the weakness of the Count of Paris and the impotence of French monarchism after the dashed hopes of 1873. Indeed, it exposed the impotence of the French right, who would have to cling to populists like Boulanger while the government dealt with the Catholic Church in a similar vein to their response to the French princes eliminating their influence over education and then liquidating the last vestiges of the Napoleonic concordat with the Catholic Church with Emile Combes' separation of church and state at the beginning of the 20th century. The cause of Bourbon legitimism would continue with the Carlists in Spain, though following the defeat of Charles VII in the Third Carlist War, Carlism would remain as a movement in Navarre, um, near the French border, it should be noted. And of course, Navarre was the original kingdom of Henry IV, the founder of the Bourbon dynasty. Carlism would continue as a political force until the Carlist claimants fractured at the beginning of the Spanish War, uh, Spanish um, uh, Civil War. And as a political idea, as a movement, Carlism was definitively neutered under Franco. The Comte de Chambord had been unconcerned with his successor, content to let the principles of legitimism die with him. The idea of monarchy that died with him was unblemished, something holy to be reclaimed at some later indefinite date, like the second coming of Christ, in stark contrast to the Orleanists and their popular monarchy by the citizen king. It is certainly possible that had Chambord compromised on his principles, he would have been driven from the throne regardless and would die without a throne and without principle. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied that Chambord's obstinacy had accelerated the cause of the Republic, and that with his death, a secure French public Republic was born, and thereafter, all French governments would be republics. All right, that is um, the end of uh, this evening's lecture. Um, I'll, I'll just see if we have any super chats, but while I'm uh, going to navigate through if we have any super chats uh do please i'll be here for at least 10 minutes send a flurry of uh, of questions so um i can respond and i can actually have a little bit of back and forth and interaction uh with the audience which isn't just uh getting at me about the etymology of uh of communism and and all that sort of stuff about Karl marx which really was tangential right Oh my goodness. Um, Yu Zhengzhu, uh, is that a late Ming dynasty emperor? Um, if I remember, um, 
my goodness, sent $250. Thank you very much. That's incredibly generous. Um, I don't really know what to say. Um, thank you so much. A long overdue expression of appreciation. Thank you for the hours of edifying content. God bless you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Yu Sheng Shu. That's very kind of you. Thank you um, so much. And I think that more than makes up for the uh, <laughs> for the absence of um, other super chats. Um, what is 99 Iron Duke saying? The Prince Imperial's mother uh, was a friend of Queen Victoria, and she used her influence to get him sent to Zululand. Yes, that was the Empress Eugenie uh, of, uh, of France. Um, indeed, Queen Victoria's sympathy for the Bonapartist cause. It should be noted because I haven't actually mentioned Britain at all. <laughs> Britain was in no way Gladstone in particular, even Disraeli, but Gladstone in particular, because he was prime minister from, in his first term, from 18, or his first ministry. I hate to use the uh, American language infecting everything regarding offices and terms and uh, administrations. And, but anyway, the ministry, the first ministry of Gladstone was from 1868 until 1874. So he had all the influence regarding this particular set of circumstances regarding the restoration. And Queen Victoria's own idea that it should be the Prince Imperial should be restored to the throne of France as some way of maintaining the peace of Europe. And of course, Gladstone, and we all know Gladstone's opinion of Queen Victoria and vice versa, uh, would have absolutely none of it whatsoever. But um, it's only appropriate that given the rapprochement between England and France during the Second Empire, that the Prince Imperial should die in an obscure British colonial conflict. Um, Josephina, I would like an intense set of lectures. Read the Holy Roman Empire. Would you be open to this? And what cost would you charge? Well, I, I don't do anything just by by charge, I do things based on what I'm interested in and any sort of financial appreciation, while it is greatly appreciated, it's, it's incidental. Um, I have done a series of lectures on the Holy Roman Empire. I've done a episode on the formation of the Holy Roman Empire, various episodes concerning the Habsburgs, various episodes concerning um, Maximilian I von Habsburg in particular, and I have done uh, imperial dualism, which actually focuses quite a lot on the uh, the constitutional mayhem, which was caused by having a bipolar empire. And I mean bipolar in the sense that there were two poles, not in the sense that it went up and down. Um, and of course, I have a lecture which chronicles the end of the Holy Roman Empire and the crises that immediately precipitated it in 1801 and 1802. So as for doing more stuff on the Holy Roman Empire, I'm not sure. It would have to be specific episodes, like um, talking about the imperial constitution during a particular time, talking about Reich's reform, the imperial reform program. Um, so and I may want to do an episode just purely dedicated to um, the, the imperial knights and their, their enduring role um in the empire I, i'd also i want to discuss um the empire and eschatology uh, i want to basically focus on the empire as it existed within a christian uh millenarian mindset um what the empire meant to people rather than looking at this ridiculous rather superficial idea that the holy roman empire was not an empire, it wasn't holy and wasn't Roman, which is quite frankly ridiculous. Um, if you're looking at it from a purely sort of materialist point of view, yes, it didn't control Rome. Yes, it was decentralized. Um, but the whole basis of it was the idea of the continuation of Rome and the, the preservation of the Christian res republica or the unity of Christendom. And that idea continued even after the fall of the technical fall of the abdication of Francis I in 1806 with the House of Austria up until the deposition and the death of Karl um, after the First World War. All right. 
Um, there is quite a bit on the Habsburgs behind the paper. Well, no, uh, Lady Charlotte, there's quite a lot which is free. Um, there must be at least about sort of four uh, lectures which are behind a pay which aren't behind a paywall. Um, what there is behind a paywall um, is are a lot of discussions. So I've kept part one of Nations of Charlemagne up for the most part. And if you want to have the adjoining discussions, um, then you have to sort of go behind a paywall, I'm afraid. But there is enough out there for free, um, which you can sink your teeth into. Um, all right, well, uh, Josefina Hervega for um, $10, has just sent $10 based on um, uh, based on my answering of his uh, Holy Roman Empire question. So uh, thank you very much. But like I said, I mean, I have such a, I, I've given myself such a long list of things to do. I still have to finish um, Orthodoxy, Autocracy and Nationality. I have at least four, um, five empire, f four or five episodes of that. Um, and th there are other things I want to do before I get onto that. If anyone's interested in the trajectory of these episodes, these particular episodes focusing on France. Um, obviously, I've already done Napoleon III, just done uh, De Comte de Chambord. I thought of two other episodes for this, which was looking at the end of the Third Empire, and uh, the Third Republic, sorry, and looking at Vichy France, looking at uh, 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 Marshal Pétain, and an episode following from that would be on de Gaulle, uh, because de Gaulle interests me greatly uh, for various reasons. So if anyone's interested in the trajectory of this mini-series, those would be the two next episodes, uh, Vichy France and the formation of the French Fifth Republic. Uh, John, not real name. Would you analyze the perseverance of the idea of the Roman Empire? For some reason, the Habsburgs, the French, the Italians, and the Popes in general politics for a long time base themselves around it. Why? They base themselves around it. Why? Because when Constantine converted to Christianity and he issued the Edict of Milan, which was later reinforced when Theodosius the Great made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire. Uh, Dominus Deus, master in God, the emperor was transfigured into basically the vice regent of universal Christendom, and by extension, the sword of the papacy, or basically the protector of the, the five patriarchs, Alexandria, Antioch, Constantinople, and Rome, if you believe in that sort of thing. So it is an incredibly, it is an essential image in terms of evoking universal authority. No empire after the Roman Empire was able to, say, for example, conquer the entire uh, coastline of the Mediterranean. Um, it was the empire which held all of these holy sites from Jerusalem to Rome together. And it is the legacy of the Christian church, which flourished during the 4th and the 5th century, which allowed European civilization to be restored when Clovis was anointed the first king of France, if I remember correctly, in the year 500. So in terms of a potent idea to rest your legitimacy on, what better example can you get than the Christian Roman Empire, which is why the Habsburgs and the Russians adopted the double eagle as the symbol of their authority, as did the Holy Roman Empire the eagle with two heads, one looking to the east and one looking to the rest, one representing Constantinople, one representing Rome as the symbol of Constantine's capital, the Christian cities, east and west. And of course, the Pope adopts it for obvious reasons, giving what we talk about the donations of Constantine and the centrality of Rome as the uh, Civitas Dei, the city of God. Um, as for the Italians, the Italian nation state had more superficial reasons for doing that. Um, uh, Mussolini's uh, fascistic postmodernism and wanting to recapture a, a rather absurd idea of a modern Caesar, which Napoleon carried off with more success, which is your French example, in which, of course, Napoleon styled himself on the eagle as well. Uh, 
what about the controversy regarding the donations to Constantine and the fact that they were probably forged? They may have been forged, yes. Right. Yes, Charles de Gaulle was despised by the French right to the point that they were trying to assassinate him. Yep. And that was, was one of the reasons why I want to focus on him as de Gaulle is refocusing, like, like Napoleon, refocusing the French Empire away from its colonial attachments and focusing everything back on Europe. We're the notable example of when he went to Canada and uh, he got involved in the internal politics and uh, was promoting Canadian uh, Quebecois uh, separatism. Uh, Riposte eight for two dollars. It was Roman, it was holy, and it was an empire. Well, thank you, Riposte. You're not going to get any uh, dissension on my part. All right. Thank you very much for listening. I'm planning on hosting a dis another discussion on France, which is going to be the sequel to the Scouring of England episode. It's uh, John D is making a, a glorious return, um, not like Henry V, and we are going to be talking about iconoclasm during the French Revolution. I may be adding a, a couple of elements to that, such as talking about the iconoclasm of the French wars of religion and the, uh, the iconoclasm of what has only been tangentially discussed today, which is the Paris Commune, the Communards. So that will be the episode on uh, Sunday night. And on Wednesday, I will be hosting a members only it should be noted, and that's on the, um, have I done an equestrian tier? No, I think it's for all members, um, based on my alternative history scenario, which I did with Marcus Furious Pertinax last week. Um, I'm doing another alternative history scenario behind a paywall, as per the usual um, AM after hours, and it is going to focus on what if the Axis powers won World War II? but you're going to have to become a member of the channel in order to watch that discussion with Marcus Furious Pertinax. All right. Thank you, everyone, everyone, for watching. Remember to like, leave a comment, and subscribe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, everyone, for leaving a super chat, especially that very generous uh, super chat by uh, Yu Sheng Zhu. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening, and good night.